Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute. I think we're just going to wait another half a minute or so because of our technology. Slowly, people are coming in. I can see that, but we're in for a we're in for a real treat tonight. I'm very much looking forward to tonight's discussion. We're so fortunate to be this evening partner with Peking University Alumni Association. And I don't know if you can see it here, but a big shout out to China Institute Trustee Ruth Jin, um, who joins us in helping to pull together what promises to be a, a super interesting evening. Um, nothing could be more topical um, thinking about how Chinese corporations and America collaborate, how we work together, how capital markets work. And I'm thinking, you know, how are capital markets work going to go as we move forward? Um, what is the formula going to be? What is the prospects for IPOs, which have been the source for so many Chinese companies seeking to raise capital? What about special purpose acquisition corporations? Um, but underneath it all is China Institute's commitment to giving Americans a deeper insight into what makes China tick. And one thing that's been so important to the relationship has been the business community. And it's truly been a backbone of helping America better understand China and helping the world be a better place because for more than 20 years, this has been a space where Americans and China and Chinese have come together to think about growth. And I'm delighted and looking forward to hear what the prospects are both for the immediate future, as well as perhaps for more longer term engagement and collaboration. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Dinda Elliott, who's gonna be your host for this evening, and she'll introduce the panelists. So over to you, Dinda. Wonderful, thanks, James. So as James said, tonight, tonight's subject is very hot um, right now because investors are all wondering what's gonna happen with Chinese IPOs following tightening of regulations here in the States. And uh, now that we have a new administration in DC, the question is, will the tighter restri restrictions be enforced and where will this be going? What's what's the future for Chinese IPOs? Uh, we're delighted tonight to have three extremely knowledgeable speakers because they're real practitioners. Uh, these are people who are actually doing the business they're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, so they know the deal. Uh, I wanna say that we are gonna take some questions at the end. So um, please, as you're listening, think of questions and type them into the Q&A section, um, the, the icon at the bottom of your screen, and um, we will get to them at the end. So, so please be, um, be thinking of questions. So let me just introduce our, our speakers. Um, tonight we have Melanie Chen, who comes to this conversation from an, an accounting perspective. Um, Melanie is a tax and accounting expert who has, has more than 20 years of experience in cross-border acquisitions and public offerings between the United States and China. She established the China Group at UHY in 2005. Um, Anthony LaCour brings a banking and wealth management perspective to the discussion tonight. He's a managing director at Wedbush Securities with extensive experience advising domestic and international clients in the consumer goods sector on M&A assignments, strategy advisory, and capital financing initiatives. And finally, Ruth Jin brings tremendous legal experience to the table. Uh, at the firm she founded, Jin and Capel, Ruth specializes in corporate and securities law. She knows the ins and outs of the challenges listing companies face these days. Ruth is also chairman of the Peking University Alumni Association of Greater New York, as James mentioned, and most importantly, a trustee of China Institute and a much appreciated supporter of everything that we do to broaden dialogue. dialogue. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your work on this program, Ruth. Um, we're delighted to have you all. So, so let's start by first setting the stage uh, for people. Tony, I'm gonna turn to you first, I think, if you don't mind, and ask you to explain first why Chinese companies want to list in the States in the first place, particularly given you know, the fact that the environment is not exactly welcoming to Chinese companies these days, or it seems like it's not. Why do they want to list here in the first place? Well, I think first and foremost, you have to consider that um, despite some of the political, you know, upheaval and whatnot, uh, particularly over the last two years, uh, there have been a tremendous amount of 
Chinese companies uh, accessing the U.S. capital markets. Uh, for example, back in 2019, you had probably about uh, 28 IPOs in the market for about close to $4 billion. Despite all the, uh, you know, uh, issues, uh, the political issues, particularly with, you know, Trump speaking about delisting, you know, existing Chinese companies and et cetera, you had a, a 240% increase mm-hmm. in China IPOs in the U.S. It's about 33 different deals for almost $12 billion. So despite all these headwinds, there's still been tremendous uh, tremendous interest, and and the average size of these uh, of these IPOs has really jumped as well. Uh, you look at uh, 2019, and that was probably somewhere around 100, 100, uh, you know, 100 billion. And this past year, it jumped to three 360 billion. So that kind of gives you a perspective that it's still a very lucrative and attractive market for Chinese companies. And there's probably three primary reasons. Uh, Most of them hinging around higher valuations, investor access, and increased credibility. Under the higher valuations, uh, you know, typically Chinese companies listing in the U.S. can receive better valuation premiums. Uh, it's, it's, uh, It's a larger market and more liquid market. So that really has been a key driver. Additionally, you have probably more, you have more flexibility in in listing standards. You could take something like Hong Kong where, uh, you know, they have minimum float requirements and all float means is just basically, you know, stock that's not otherwise, you know, restricted. So Hong Kong has, you know, it's, it's more restrictive, although we can talk about how that's going to be overcome as, as well. Then you have investor investor access. Um, a lot of a lot of Chinese companies understand that there's a broader investment base here, and that broader investment base uh, is much more accepting with a wide range of valuation perspectives, and so that gives them more flexibility. And investors in, in, in the U.S. have a very strong appetite for Chinese offerings. Uh, gives them, you know, access to companies with strong growth and particularly, you know, in a, ra- in, in a rapidly growing Chinese uh, economy. So, uh, you, you know, when you look at, uh, when you look at the top, th- when you look at the top 10 IPOs in the U.S. in 2020, three of those were Chinese, uh, Chinese companies. And then I think, Another very important aspect is is increased credibility. Um, in, you know, here Chinese companies, are, you know, really you know uh, t- place a lot of value on, on on being able to access, you know, a U.S. research analysts, uh, and it gives them a, a means to get to value, you know, valuable, uh, you know, uh, institutional investors. So that's that's key because the institutional market, here, particularly for public securities, is 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 looking for growth. I think another key aspect is, uh, uh, you know, the market here is is more transparent than the Chinese market, and so from from an investor standpoint, that gives them a little bit a degree of more more comfort. And then you have you know an issue sometimes, particularly. In the Chinese markets, where there are more state-controlled currency and other regulatory issues, which can affect valuation. So I think those three factors, you know, are a big driving force. I mean, last year you had, you know, three really noteworthy deals: um, Lufax, which which did about a 2.4 billion dollar uh, IPO. Uh, you had Xping, which did about a billion and a half. And you know we have uh, from from my from my uh, company we have we have we have worked you know through affiliates and whatnot looking at a lot of these a lot of these now obviously um, there's you know a lot of the bigger firms will 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 underwrite these issues but uh, to the extent that I think to some extent we even have a better perspective because we have a lot of 
when you talked about the asset management. I, mean, I don't really do a lot of asset management, but Wetbush has a, you know, my, my firm has a big asset, asset management uh, group of Asian investors. And so a lot of the perspectives that we get in here are from their interest in the market. Right. So I think those are, are, are key considerations that, that, you know, yes, there are a lot of headwinds, but despite that, there's still rampant activity going from 2019 to 2020. That's fascinating, Tony. And, uh, you know, the, you would not know that actually from just kind of, you know, reading the headlines. Uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, reading the headlines, it kind of sounds and feels like everything's shutting down and it's not, you know, not moving ahead. It's so, not. So, so, Ruth, you know, I want to turn to you for a second to ask you to tell us, okay, so given that's the backdrop, that's what's been happening and what's, what's going on. And despite the negativity, there's still a lot of interest in uh, moving ahead with IPOs, but what is happening in terms of the regulations and why is everybody talking about the future of Chinese IPOs? What's the problem? What are the Chinese companies up against now? Whoops, Ruth, you're, you're uh, muted. You've got to unmute, yeah. yeah. There you go. So um, there are about four new rules and guidelines issued since 2020 yeah. that are aimed at Chinese companies specifically. And uh, these are in addition to the CFIUS rules previously passed by the Trump administration. So I just go over these uh, four new rules or yeah. guidelines briefly to yeah. give some idea. Yeah. So the first one I want to I wanna, uh, address is the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. So this was in response to the uh, lack of com uh, compliance among Chinese companies listed on US exchanges to allow public company accounting oversight board, it's called the PCAOB, to inspect their audit papers and their auditing audit forms. So PCAOB was created by the, by the Sarbanes-Oxley Act uh, of 20. 2002 to oversee the audits of public companies. But Chinese law do not allow uh, their audit firms to be inspected by a, a foreign entity such as PCAOB. So this bill requires uh, moving forward that uh, if the PCAOB is unable to audit uh, specific, uh, you know, the reports uh, because the issuer has retained the foreign public accounting firm, not subject to inspection by the PCAOB, uh, then the issuer must certify that it is not owned or controlled by a foreign government. And furthermore, if the PCAOB, this issue is not resolved, this issuer, this China-based issuer, the securities are banned from trade on a national exchange or through other methods. So this bill was coincide. I mean, this issue it was uh, was around for a long time. It's not like uh, it happened in, in, like in the past year, but this bill was coincided with the high profile financial scandal involving Chinese coffee company called the Luckin uh, Coffee. Um, it was delisted uh, by Nasdaq due to an accounting fraud concerning a fabrication uh, of about three hundred ten ten million dollars in sales in 2019. And uh, this bill could have the effect of forced delisting of shares and ADRs of China-based issuers from US stock exchanges if this PCAOB issue is not resolved. So- um, Can I jump in for one sec before, before you continue? So when the Luckin scandal happened, did US investors suffer from that or, or what was the impact? Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. the stock price uh, went down 80%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, yeah, so definitely U.S. investors suffer. So real people do get hurt by this stuff. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, you know, that scandal, uh, the, the, you know, the, the Larkin got the notice from the NASDAQ on May 19th, and then May 20th, the bill passed the U.S. House of Representatives by unanimous consent. Mm -hmm. And then the law became effective uh, in December 2020. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Mm -hmm. And the second one is in November 2020, the SEC issued a new disclosure guidelines on China-based issuers. And it required uh, China-based issuers to uh, have a more detailed uh, uh, description of the risks involving China. So I can go over that in, in, in other time. Mm -hmm. And then the third one, which is significant, is uh, the Trump administration's executive order banning securities of com communist China military companies 
Mm -hmm. So this executive order bans any transaction by a U.S. person involving the securities or derivatives of securities of any communist Chinese military company, which is defined as any company that is owned or controlled by Chinese military. So as of today, 31 companies are named that includes uh, some many companies that are already traded here. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, you know, ban also based on the statement issued by the National Security Advisor Robert uh, O'Brien, this executive uh, order is also intended to cover passive institutional investment vehicles such as mutual funds that provides investment exposure to this type of Chinese securities. Mm -hmm. So these, you know, may, and, and you know, so this has to be, has to be got, gotten rid of by, I think it's November, 2021. Yeah. So the 31 companies and related uh, derivatives and all the securities. So that's the third one. The last one I want to mention is the FINRA's uh, guideline issued uh, to its members, uh, such as uh, Tony's company. And because uh, it's mainly related to anti-money laundering, because both in the United States and the China on both sides, certain individuals are prohibited from owning foreign stock. So many Chinese shareholders who have some kind of ties with the Chinese Communist Party, they don't want to disclose that they're owning uh, some shares here. So what they do is they use something called the nominee account. They have someone else hold the shares for them investment for them. And so on the paper is someone else holding the share, but it's actually their shares. So the FINRA realized that the, this, this in the US, you know, you have to disclose with the, the fully disclosure is not allowed, but because uh, Chinese uh, investors often use this technique, FINRA issued a guideline warning its members uh, to make sure that the anti-money laundering uh, compliance is properly done with, in this, in, uh, with respect to Chinese uh, issuers. So these are uh, uh, rules and you know new rules and it sounds quite scary and I think it's okay for the government to be very worried whether or not the market is going to be worried you know that's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you again, helping to set the stage. And then, uh, you know, these are there are so many questions that we want to follow up on. It's great stuff. Um, but first. Let's turn to Melanie. Um, Melanie, share with us the the accounting, sort of the way the accounting worked. And basic, I guess one of the questions I have is, why were they allowed to get away with this for so many years in the first place? I mean, why why was it that the U.S. was willing to kind of bend the rules and let Chinese companies, you know, not have their books um, reviewed? Uh, you know, in the U.S., but but if you could explain kind of how the, you know, what is it that was not permitted, and what has happened to the accounting firms in China and the U.S. as a result of all this? Oh, sorry, you're muted. I guess the question, I guess the question is kind of, is the accounting industry are they in a panic about this? I mean, this must be very complicated and difficult for them. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Odinda. That's a very good uh, question, and uh, um, it's uh, it has been my question for many years too, uh, because uh, PCOB, as uh, Ruth uh, mentioned uh, earlier, PCOB stands for uh, Public uh, Company uh, Accounting Super Oversight Board. So uh, their responsibility is to inspect all the CPA firms that uh, audit public companies, and uh, foreign company foreign CPA firms can register with PCOB. Once you register and get the uh, PCOB approval, then any CPA firms anywhere in the world can audit uh, companies public traded on U U U.S. stock exchange. So um, the situation right now in China, all the CPA firms uh, are now inspected by PCOB. And on the basis that uh, Chinese security law, uh, if they provide the audit the work paper, that will violate the Chinese security law. But actually, when you look into the Chinese security law, there's no such clear um, uh, statement or clause that prohibits Chinese CPA firms from, from providing uh, audit work paper to uh, US, uh, um, any US government. So wait, wait, wait. Let, me just, let me stop you for one sec, just to make sure I understand and make sure everybody understands what you're saying. So 
You were saying that in China, the security firms or the accounting firms? Um, accounting firms. Accounting firms, okay. Right. Yeah, right. so uh, but, but accounting firms. And the accounting firms said that they could not, uh, you know, because of national security laws or whatever, they could not uh, allow their work to be reviewed. But you're saying that there is no such law in the books. Well, there's no clear uh, provision. Okay in yeah. the laws say, that says that the CPA firms are not prohibited from providing- uh, oh, CPA work. firms, got it. Right, CPA firms or accounting firms. And yeah. so, but, you know, uh, Chinese government certainly does not encourage or support those CPA firms to, pro to share their work paper to provide access to uh, PCAOB for inspection. Like US CPA firms every year, um, PCOB come in and inspect our work paper. And for CPA firms that um, um, registered with the PCOB, if you are uh, an inspector, the inspection report are public, published on the PCOB website. So you can go into, uh, onto the website and find out the quality of the CPA firm's work, all the work. But okay. there's no such transparency when it comes to Chinese CPA firms. And I don't think this is uh, the fault of the Chinese CPA firms. It's not like they, um, it's really a um, standoff between the Chinese government and the uh, US government. Uh, Chinese uh, uh, government, uh, especially the uh, Chinese Security Regulatory Commission, and specifically, you know, uh, made a statement that they allow PCOB to inspect, but it has to be inspected through uh, Chinese uh, government. Which means Sorry, that they couldn't, the, couldn't quite understand. They allow, say again? They allow PCOB to inspect the Chinese CPA firms, but that inspection has to be collaborated through Chinese government agency, okay. which means that they organize the work paper and provide it to PCOB for inspection. But for PCOB, why they want to inspect? Because they want to see the original work paper, how those work paper is being done and uh, so whether there's any violation of the PCOB audit standards. So that's the sticky part. Um, right. How inspection will be done? I see. So, so uh, uh, let me just follow up just to say, I, I what I'd love for you to explain, because uh, you know maybe everybody in the audience understands this, but I was pretty surprised to learn that, I, I always thought it was like, you know, Chinese CPA firms that maybe I've never heard of or whatever, but you're talking about including the big four American firms who are working in China, but they're separate from the American headquarters. So it's like that, you know, Alibaba say, just for example, might've been, um, had their accounts done by one of the big four companies, but still that's, you know, that company is not able to share its the books with PCAOB. Yes. Right? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, big four CPA firms, they, in each country, they are independent yeah. from each other. So right. the big four US are totally two separate uh, uh, firms from big four in China. They don't share their work paper. And mm -hmm. for U.S. Uh, uh, professionals have no access to the work mm -hmm. paper of the big four in China. And uh, um, they are independent uh, forms. And uh, uh, the, uh, the audit report in, in the audit world, it's very important who is the principal auditor. And that mm -hmm. means who's the auditor who sent the audit report. And in, when you see uh, Alibaba's um, um, audit report, financial statement that is signed by PwC China, that means, you know, this is a, a, a firm that is separate from the PwC US and US, US firm has nothing to do with the report issued by PwC China. Right, so how, before we- I have, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Uh, what about situations, particularly since you, since you note uh, Alibaba? Alibaba did their, their, their IPO here, but their secondaries have been done in the Hong Kong market. So I'm wondering, particularly on this particular uh, issue, uh, because the financials, obviously, they're, they're segregated, you know, uh, how, does, how, how is that handled? This is for Melanie. How is that handled? Because yep. since they can't share their work papers and financials. 
Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure how Alibaba's due listing, the audit is being handled. And, uh, um, but uh, for the US, the uh, um, Alibaba's auditor is qualified for issue Alibaba's audit report for US listing. And my guess is that your, the, their uh, auditor probably has the qualification for issue their audit report that to be listed mm -hmm. on Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And they okay. may have like Hong Kong has, has to, you have to use Hong Kong gap, uh, Hong yes. Kong efforts. So they may exactly. have to have that of a uh, financial statement and but it will be done by one firm. And what okay. happens to companies that are already listed that, that uh, you know, what, what happens to them? Uh, you mean for uh, companies that are already traded on the stock yes. exchange? Yes. Uh, since the um, the hold uh, hold the foreign uh, company uh, holding uh, foreign company yeah. accountable act uh, become effective, I don't see any um, large Chinese companies uh, have changed their auditor as a result of this uh, uh, the bill, the new bill. And but I think because they still have a three year window. Okay. And uh, I think when next year we, will, we are going to see some movement. I discussed with some companies that audited by the big four in China. I said, what's your plan? And they said that, you know, we still have time. We hope that uh, the government uh, between the two countries will come up with a solution. And otherwise, you know, they will wait until some market leaders to make the change. For example, okay. if Alibaba and JD.com make a change their auditor, they will follow. Otherwise, they will stay put. But it might be, for example, they might say, "Okay, we're gonna, we're not gonna have uh, the Chinese uh, PwC do our audit. Instead, we might move our business to the U.S. PwC." And those two, yeah, it, it is a possibility. There's yeah. a possibility, but the big four between China and the U.S. There are some conflict. One is the territorial issue because yeah. the big four in China want to keep their business, their yeah. clients. They yeah, don't want yeah. their big brother from the U.S. to take away their biggest trophy client. Of course, and the yeah. second is about the PCOB audit standard uh, requires the principal auditor to do majority of the work, audit work. So majority audit work means that your own professionals, employees do more than 50% of the audit work. How the U.S. big four meet that principal audit requirement will become an issue. Are they going to you know, send their um, people to work in China all year round, or they outsource those work to big for China and how much they are going to outsource for so they can meet the principal audit requirement. Those issues they should discuss with the PCOB right. and to find a solution going forward. One solution is that the US as the principal auditor and so they have the audit work paper in right. the US on the servers of the US CPA firm. So PCOB will have access to those audit work paper without having to go to China and have to uh, go through the Chinese uh, government. But that's another issue is that Chinese uh, security law may not allow those big four firms to um, you know, share those work paper even with their affiliates right. in the US. I think right. that the, the key issue is the work paper, not who, which firm, perform the audit work, yeah, yeah, the work yeah, yeah. access. Yeah, so I've got a question. I, you know, it's kind of a question for all of you, but I guess let's start with you, Ruth, if you don't mind. Um, you know, you're spelling out all these new restrictions that you described. I guess my first question is, why were the Chinese companies allowed to sort of get away with, you know, not complying with the regulations that were there in the first place? Um, was it just that China was so hot and everybody and, and also China, the view of China was more positive? Um, you know, I guess I'm wondering is, are these tightened regulations, is, is this politically driven or is it really, you know, an effort to protect U.S. investors and, you know, just make sure they comply with regulations? So um, I think it's both. So the, the executive order the made by Trump, President Trump. Yeah, that's uh, politically driven, because as we speak, um, you know, ten years ago, Chinese China was a tiny, not not tiny, but uh, emerging market. I mean, it's yeah. from yeah. the investor standpoint, 
it is still emerging market, but it is the second largest economy. And as we speak, a Chinese uh, spaceship is orbiting Mars. Yes, good. And the Chinese military, not only the technology is taking over, catching up with America, but the spending is catching up as well. And armed control treaty is not possible with China because China consistently rejected that proposal. So the executive order to limit Chinese military influenced companies to have access to the global capital market or end technology mm -hmm. is politically driven to deter the expansion and enhancement of US and Chinese military. Mm -hmm. so that's politically driven. The, the SEC's new guidelines and FINWAS, that's more is a, is a more fair game. It's about leveling the playing field and make, making sure the Chinese companies play by the rules yeah. and then the US investors are protected. Uh -huh. So why they haven't done it, um, it's a good question. I think they, they overlooked it um, because China's a Chinese you know, growth rate was so high. So it's like the mortgage-backed security prices. Yes. Then, you know, no matter the underlying whatever, if, if it's going, price is going up, 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 and the Wall Street is very interested, they kind of overlook that, that little problem. So, I mean, there, there are quite a lot of risks related to China-based uh, securities. So now the SEC is asking the, the issuers to really lay out those risks. Got it, got it, got it. So, so actually a follow-up question for you, Ruth. Um, when China-based companies go public in the US, do they take different structural approaches from US domestic companies? And is there, is there you know, somehow more risk for, for investors or how, do, how does it work? Right, so um, the, you know, the Chinese law either outright prohibit or limit foreign ownership in Chinese companies. Uh, in certain industries such as education, telecommunication, infrastructure. So because of that, if a Chinese company wanna go public in the United States, they really cannot go public directly like American companies. So what they do is they use alternative structures. So one of the most popular alternative structures is called the VIE structure. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the VIE, variable interest uh, entities. Yeah. So this is, uh, you know, just to give an example of Alibaba. So, uh, so Alibaba China would form an Alibaba Cayman Islands, and the two companies' names are identical, both are Alibaba, and the Alibaba Cayman Islands is basically owned by two people, Jack Ma and the second largest uh, shareholder of Alibaba China, and this Alibaba Cayman Islands is the company who goes public in, in, in the United States, not the Chinese company, actual company. Okay. So the Alibaba Cayman Islands would form a wholly owned subsidiary in China. It's called Wufi. And yep. then it's 100% owned. And this uh, money raised through the IPO is funneled through the Cayman company to this wholly owned uh, subsidiary. And then this wholly owned subsidiary would enter into three or four contracts with Alibaba China. So that contract often involves a loan agreement between the wholly owned subsidiary and Jack Ma, the owners, not the, not the owners. And the owners borrow that money and then pledge their shares to that wholly owned subsidiary with a bunch of consent rights. So, and then there's some other two or three other agreements so long story short, it's a contractual arrangement whereby the wholly owned subsidiary will have some kind of controls mimicking the equity ownership control into the Chinese company. So using this technique, uh, the, the Alibaba China made the Chinese law requirement that says you cannot have any foreign ownership, whether it's individual or company. If a company owns Alibaba, then all the companies, the shareholders must be Chinese also. So, so they meet the Chinese requirement. From the US uh, investor standpoint, they have the, they, they own the profit and they have, a, you know, they don't have a shareholder voting rights because they're not shareholders uh, of Ch Alibaba China, but, but they have a, a quite a lot of power, quite similar to um, the shareholder power, but it's not the same. So that's one uh, structure that's different. And using those structure, the, diff the second different things that they, they use is uh, often they use uh, alternative uh, ways to go public, um, like you know, 
by Michelle. So there are three types of shells they like. Uh, you know, one type uh, is one is reverse merger and spec, and then the form ten shells. And with the reverse merger, it just you know the shell is a different type. A reverse merger shells is already it's a public shell on Nasdaq, for example, but it's a former operating company who went out of business. So they buy into that company and be go public. That's a reverse merger going public. SPAC is, you know, it's not a former operating company. It's a, some sponsors on purpose from scratch. They form a SPAC special purpose acquisition company with the intention to find uh, the target of one or two target and merge into it. And Chinese company want to be that target. And that's another way they, they love to do it. The right. third way is they use, I mean, I mean, a few years ago was popular with Form 10 Shell and become popular again. So these are different kind of alternative ways Chinese companies go public. That's quite different from, uh, even though the you know uh, the U.S. companies use a similar sometimes reverse merger and spec as well, but you know the majority of the Chinese issuers use uh, this type of uh, structures, mm -hmm. uh, most prominently VIE. Right. And so there are different risks associated with it that SEC is concerned about, such as you know shareholders don't have the recourse like U.S. shareholders have. The SEC do not have the supervisory and enforcement power because the Section 177 of Chinese securities law provides that no foreign regulator can collect any document from. So it prohibits, uh, prohibits any Chinese people to submit any data and document to foreign regu securities regulators. So whether or not PCAOB qualifies securities regulator, that's one question. And secondly, the law that passed, the Chinese securities law that's uh, passed in March, 2020, it, that, it didn't say you cannot do it. It says, if you get the approval from Chinese government, you can do it. So the key is to get the approval. Um, you need to get the prior approval from Chinese government in order to cooperate with the state uh, department of justice or SEC to supervise and enforce anything um, uh, uh, against China-based issuers. Just to quickly just add, you know, just given context. So if the Facebook have something going on and the SEC is worried about it, SEC have the subpoena power in America. They can just subpoena the documents and do investigation and just, you know, correct the mistake and find whatever they want to do. The China-based uh, uh, issuers, that's clearly substantially restricted because of Chinese regulations, but they can they can ask for approval, which you know probably not given. So these are you know the the difference in structures and risks related to China based. So issues. fascinating, so fascinating, and it's so, sounds... so uh, yeah. Go Ruth, ahead. Uh, from, from a practical standpoint, they're, they're not doing many reverse reverse uh, uh, you know listings, right? Our our mergers. That's, they I are because that, that's a, but that's apart from a SPAC, is what I'm saying. I beg your pardon. It's different from a SPAC. It's different from it's SPAC. Different it's from SPAC. A different yeah. from SPAC. It's just a law is different. It is uh, because a, uh, the SPAC is, uh, you know, it's formed from scratch by sponsors and the sponsors exactly. go. Yeah. You know, hang on, hang on. Let's, uh, let me just yeah, jump no in for a Let me just jump entity. in for a second, Tony. Sorry, excuse me. But just to, since if we're going to be talking about SPACs, let's introduce what a SPAC is. So, so my understanding is that this SPACs, which is a special purpose acquisition corporation, right? Um, it has become, has been around for a long time, was not considered to be um, a kind of, uh, well, was not, not uh, sort of mainstream, not a mainstream um, sort of approach, uh, but now it's the hot new thing. And, um, you know, so now Chinese companies are, but can, can Tony, do you want to explain just very briefly for the audience what a SPAC is, like what's it's, how it works, just very briefly. Well, yeah, well, basically, a SPAC, as you said, is, is is set up where you have sponsors that come in, raise a certain amount of capital, uh, wh where you know they they will the charter will be to go after a target company. Mm -hmm. Generally, there's there's just from a structural standpoint, uh, they'll buy those shares for ten dollars a share. Uh, they uh, they also have the capability where 
they have to set, you know, set aside uh, a certain amount of about that money, put it in escrow. Um, they'll get those investors will get a certain amount of warrants, and the purpose, you know, once again is to to find a target. Uh, and they and have then, they have a time limit. It's like within two years. Two years. They have two years in which to find that target. And once they do find a target, then, uh, you know, the sponsors will roll that money into the, 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 the target company. They become minority shareholders, but they have a big sponsor promote. And uh, generally, they're issued at, you know, uh, $10 a share. Yeah. Uh, and, so, you know, so just, let me just jump in for a sec. I think, you know, people have a general idea of how what it is now. So is this a way for the for Chinese companies? Can they avoid the kind of all the new regulations that Ruth was uh, describing? Is that a way to avoid those regulations to sort of get listed that way through a SPAC? Ruth, do you want to jump in? No, I don't, I, I don't think so. OK. In the laws, you can't really avoid the foreign ownership restrictions. Yeah. Cannot avoid the Trump's yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it can give you a bit of uh, flexibility in terms of, you know, that if if there is more than one company, the spec is gonna combine. So one is being Chinese, and then the one is American. Maybe there's a way to play with the ownership structure, like the one of the proposals made by TikTok when they were forced to divest, whatever, leave the, you know, so. If there's more than one companies that the spec sponsor is identifying, that one of them is Chinese company have a Chinese component, maybe there's a way to kind of overcome some of these restrictions. Right. So yeah. there is some room for that. Right. And also, and with the spec, you know, you have these original sponsors that, that they are highly qualified. That you know, it's not just like regular reverse merger. The surviving management is Chinese management. Here exactly. yeah. you, know, you have a you have a U.S. professionals who are taking control. So yeah. I think investors are more confident to rely on them uh -huh. to make that kind of judgments. So uh -huh. yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So before we jump to uh, some questions from the audience, so and again, I see there are a couple of questions that have come in. Anybody else who has questions, please remember to type them into the Q and A section. Um, I wanted to ask, step back and ask a kind of bigger, broader question, which is, firstly. You know, do you expect, I mean, Tony, it's incredible that, that you, you know, continue to see a big increase in the IPOs that are coming in or the, it was happening. So the question is, is that going to continue despite these, uh, you know, restri increased restrictions? And if not, or, you know, what do you see happening in terms of are Hong Kong and Shanghai going to benefit? If, is the United States uh, going to suffer? Uh, because, you know, a bunch of the, um, the companies are going to decide to list in Hong Kong or Shanghai instead. That's the question for all of you guys. Well, well I think, you know, from our perspective, you know, um, you, you still have, you know, a, a lot of pent up interest in, in uh, you know, in, in Chinese companies. I, I think that the key issue is, you know, Biden hasn't given indication one way or another, but irrespective of that, I think a lot of Chinese companies are becoming, you know, from, from our research and whatnot and talking to, you know, our, our affiliates and whatnot in Asia, uh, Hong Kong is, is probably going to take a bigger share. Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and, and the Shanghai markets are probably going to take a bigger cut uh, of, of those potential listings that would have probably gone to, to the U.S. Um, you still will have, you know, a strong issuance here. I don't, the general perspective is it probably uh, won't be significantly less. It might be less than it was in 2020, as I stated those statistics to you. Mm -hmm. uh, because the key thing that, uh, that's going forward is that, you know, uh, uh, particularly from a lot of the SPAC, the, the, the SPAC sponsors that are looking for growth. Um, you, you got healthcare, you have tele, te, telecom media, you have consumer and retail. But when you think about the, the forward calendar of a lot of the, the, the Chinese companies that probably will go public in 2021, like Bike Dance and Waha. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had worked with Nanfu uh, Spring, which went public uh, when I was uh, with a prior firm. A lot of those companies, you know, uh, 
uh, it's already kind of anticipated, they probably will go to one of the Asian markets. Okay. And those are, are those are billion plus, uh, uh, if not more, uh, deals, particularly Waha and ByteDance. And Tony, and they so, will go to Asian markets because. Well, it, it's just I, I think at this point in time, they they uh, particularly with Hong Kong, you know, they are trying to they're they're actively going after like these countries. I don't think, if, and Ruth could speak to this. It's not it's not as if they're going to relax you know, uh, any of their regulations. It's just a matter that because of the uncertainty, uh, we, there, there's a thought that, yes, the bigger, the bigger uh, Chinese companies will still uh, look at the, 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 the U.S. markets. But I think that the Asian markets, meaning Shenzhen, Shanghai, Shanghai and Hong Kong, are really are really you know going after and, and going after these companies as well. So mm-hmm. our perspective is is that it, it, it's probably will be flat in terms of the issuance here, if not a little bit down, but not significantly. But it will be down mm-hmm. because we just came off of a record year, as I stated earlier, a record right. year. Yeah, despite it's so fascinating, despite the fact that it was a kind of record year in terms of anti-China hysteria coming out of Washington, right? Well, that's, but, see, but that's because it became so politicized. Yes. You know, yeah. the reality was, and it, it, with these, particularly with the, 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 the shrewd investors and, and management of these, of these Chinese companies, you know, they were looking for valuation. As I explained earlier, this is where you're going to get the higher valuation. Uh-huh. So despite all the noise that was around, that, that was the reality. Mm-hmm. Right. So I do see a question from the audience. Andrew Collier is asking, it's actually a perfect follow-up question to what you were just describing, Tony. Have you seen any inflow of capital into the U.S. markets as a result of either the protests in Hong Kong or the new national security law? I'm sorry. <laughs> Not significantly, no. I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, Ruth, you might, uh, in some of your discussions, but no, I have not, I don't, I don't think so, no. Uh, I, I don't think so either. Yeah. Um, I've got another question. Where Somebody is asking, where can we learn more about the different stock markets within China and Hong Kong and the difference between A shares, et cetera? Is there a good source of information for that? Um, hmm. Most of our research comes from our own analysts, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, um, I think probably one of the biggest, you, you can get a lot of information. Actually, you know, Bloomberg has, uh, uh, obviously it's a subscription, but Bloomberg Asia is, has, has, has really been great in, in putting together a lot of the data on how the money is moving. Mm-hmm. Uh, so is S and P. So those are pretty. Yeah, I mean, and, and they're good because they're not deep into a lot of financial speak. So for most people, I think those sources would be pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so a question from Dulal Chanda, um, who is asking: Besides China, there are, of course, many foreign companies listed on U.S. securities markets. So the question is: Does PCAOB inspect the books or audit papers of all of those foreign companies? Or yeah, I guess the question is really: Is this all all this stuff? Is it targeted against Chinese companies, or is it all companies? Uh, actually, PCAOB does uh, inspect. Uh, uh, foreign CPA firms in other countries. In 2019, January or February, um, PCOB issued a list of uh, foreign CPA firms that are not inspected by uh, PCOB as a result of, you know, PCOB has no access to those uh, uh, companies, uh, to those uh, CPA firms. And primarily three jurisdictions, mainland China, Hong Kong, and uh, Belgium. But Belgium already solved that issue with PCOB. Now there's only two jurisdictions that uh, um, well, that does not uh, don't give uh, access to PCOB for inspection of CPA firms in uh, those countries uh, in Hong Kong and uh, China. And uh, I want to make clear is that it's not the inspection of the foreign companies' books. They inspect the work paper of the CPA firms. 
So there's there's a big difference, <laughs> and uh, so uh, it's a PCOB only uh, supervise and uh, oversight the um, CPA firms, not the foreign issuers. Mm -hmm. Uh, a question from Conway Downing, who is asking, what kinds of changes would you like to see in the CFIUS process in the new administration? Do you expect there to be changes? Uh, what, do, what are you all seeing coming out of DC? CFIUS, I, I don't see any changes from DC uh, with respect to CFIUS. Oh. With yeah. respect to this the new executive order and the new uh, this uh, accounting rule, uh, the SEC chairman did make a statement right before he left uh, that he ordered the staff to come up with a comprehensive um, guidelines uh, to implement these mandates. Mm -hmm. So that would be very fascinating to see. To answer, Jinda, your question about whether Chinese IPO will go down, yeah, I think you know when the CFS happened, it did significantly, significantly affect Chinese investment mm -hmm. in U.S. companies. So policies yeah. and laws, they do have impact. Um, but you know, with respect to Chinese IPOs, however, I, I don't think it's gonna be, go down sharply uh, because yeah, exactly. the Chinese are very pragmatic. And right. some of these uh, risks are a bit overblown. For example, the VIE structure you know, is not mm -hmm. tested in Chinese law, but under existing law, all the lawyers looked at it, including the stock pledge agreement, it's all consistent with the Chinese laws. and. The Chinese courts, uh, they are quite, uh, the Chinese are not bad barbarians. They may have an uh, autocratic government, but they are a highly civilized, educated country. So they wouldn't be screwing, you know, billions of, you know, the investors. They, I, I don't think that's a too big of an issue. And with, with respect to the SEC's enforcement, the Chinese SEC is a highly, highly, you know, they are all over, they inspect you like nobody else. Mm -hmm. And so, there are subject to Chinese, you know, regu regulatory uh, uh, supervision, supervision and the enforcement. And in China, financial fraud is death penalty. Mm -hmm. So there, if you're a private company owners like Jack Ma, they're a lot more careful. They don't want to touch anything. They, they are very careful in terms of not causing problems. You know, the, the corrupt people are the politicians and the bureaucrats in China, not the private the business people. <laughs> and the thirdly, thirdly, you know, the, I see from my clients, they make an, after Trump, many companies make an effort to stay private. It's in Chinese terms, it's called minqi. They do not want to have any, they can, they want to avoid, you know, government this and that from China. Mm -hmm. So that it's a, they, I think the Chinese companies will change their behavior. Right. And also some companies are moving to Singapore. So, yeah. so the, so uh, yes, so. I think the Chinese IPO will be affected, but not like, like sharply affected. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's, I mean, actually there's an interesting follow-up question. Tony, you can jump in on this, but, but it's, it's um, somebody is asking, so how, looking at the recent developments inside China to the questioner says, rein in the powers of private capital, but you know, whatever the, the, the Chinese government is, is, um, obviously, uh, you know, um, focusing more on the state sector. And so, you know, the, um, the fact that the private capital is, is being, you know, more reined in and to control monopoly power, do you think that those moves inside of China will push more Chinese companies to list in the US? Well, that's not gonna happen overnight. Yeah. And as I said before, uh, because I, uh, I agree with uh, Ruth, there, there might be some diminution in, in uh, outflows of capital, particularly coming, you know, to the U.S. and looking at, you know, a U.S. listing. Uh, so, but it's not going to be dramatic. Yeah. Now, two years from now, three years from now, uh, you know, looking out that far, there could be, you know, more, more significant changes. Mm -hmm. But the forecast for 2021 is still, you know, pretty steady, like I said. When you look at, you know, uh, a lot of the issuance last year, it was a, re you know, record year. I think it not back to 2014 was the only time when it was higher. Mm -hmm. So when you take, you know, uh, but, but still, when you look at the, the gross proceeds and volume of deals raised between the three uh, Asian markets, it still dwarfs what companies come here to do. So uh, that's, 
they, uh, yes, there will be more of those companies going to the Asian markets, but still a lot of, as Ruth said, and I think this is a very key point, is that a lot of Chinese investors are very, very shrewd. They're looking at the valuation, they're looking for credibility, and, and a lot of those things, even with Hong Kong and the other markets, they can't get any place but here. So mm-hmm. that in and of itself is going to act as, at least over the next year, kind of a floor. So the, the, the market's not going to drop out. Yeah. Well, Tony, what did you mean when you said they can't get any place but here? Excuse me? What did you mean when you just said they can't get any place but here, so they will continue coming here? No, I meant in terms of just, in, in terms of just the access to valuation. Uh, the the uh, access to analysts, institutional investors, okay. uh, the, the whole credibility exactly, thing. Because, because the market the, is so deep here. Exactly, but it's not yeah. only just this the the the, uh, the the volume valuation and just dollars. It's also the credibility that kind of validates their business. Yes. And the U.S. market is is still tops for validating these yeah. kind of Alibaba companies. So that's going to set somewhat of a floor. Yeah, yeah, got it. So we just have a couple more minutes. So I wanted to end um, by asking all of you to talk a little bit about, so if Chinese companies do want to go public in the US, um, what is your advice for them? How can they overcome the challenges that they're facing now in terms of these uh, increased restrictions? Are, you know, what are the best ways to complete a successful IPO? That's a question for each of you. And then, then we'll have to um, close, you know, close up for the evening. May I go first? Sure, please, Bonnie. Yes, so sure. um, my first advice is to uh, engage a US CPA firm as your auditor <laughs> to avoid <laughs> uncertainties. <laughs> and uh, you know, the firms like UHY, we do a lot of uh, Chinese companies audit. So that will solve a lot of uh, your headaches and uncertainties. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, Chinese law does allow US uh, or foreign CPA firms going to China and audit those such uh, Chinese companies uh, listed overseas and there's yeah. regulations uh, to have specific rules and the procedures to follow. And uh, um, my second advice is uh, to carefully, um, you know, carefully receive investment uh, p- before you go IPO. Since there's a blacklist uh, from yeah. the US government, uh, you want to carefully select your investors and uh, try not to uh, associate with the companies uh, on the blacklist. Right. I believe that list is temporary, but uh, you know, it will have some negative impact if you have those investors, but uh, better not to have. So that's my two pieces of advice. <laughs> Got it. Those are good, good pieces of advice. Okay, so Ruth, I know you're going to say that, well, the first thing you need is you have to have a really good lawyer, which certainly is true. <laughs> which is true. Absolutely. <laughs> I need to have a good lawyer in China. In, exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I think, you know, the, the companies like a TikTok, they didn't become TikTok without America. So that is the key to the, the, the um, Chinese uh, entrepreneurs know that. So that's why as, as long as just try to stay private yeah. and then have a good relationship with the Chinese government because ultimately you need this approval, that approval, and then probably need to be more flexible with their ownership control. Um, I think Chinese, the, the issuers often have a control problem. They do not want to let go of control. And then I think, uh, you know, lastly, you know, have more dialogue and make sure the you know the the Chinese the American investors understand China better because it's not so. For example, you know the 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 judgments is not enforced mutually between U.S. and China, but the arbitration is. I, arbitration is uh, enforced, and a lot of Chinese uh, 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 lawsuits uh, that the Americans who sue Chinese companies in China they win all the time. So it's not that bad. So. You know, you just have to continue to uh, disclose all the risks. And this, other than Trump's executive order, this SEC's guideline is not really anything new. It's about disclosing what's happening. And mm. the VIE structure, I, I don't think it's that dangerous, uh, like the SEC says. So the the obstacles are not as big as, it's exactly. like in the, the, any, the, the obstacles right now is headlines. It look big, but it's actually not big because exactly. all the things already existed uh-huh. except this executive uh, 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 order. So, Got it. Tony, what are your thoughts? Absolutely on doable. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think that 
it's getting to a point, you know, now, as we've been emphasizing, uh, you have to separate all, all this, uh, you know, political noise. Because at the end of the day, um, there will be a little more scrutiny. I think that's already beginning to happen. And, you know, I think uh, Ruth, Ruth uh, you know, kind of has sees that as well. But I think disclosure, the transparency issue, and a lot of these Chinese companies got, are going to have to uh, be more open in terms of uh, how they break up ownership and management control. Mm -hmm. I think I think those issues are going to be key. I think historically, you know, look, the regulations here are the regulations for listing. So, but I think that on those points, um, the anticipation is that the Biden administration will not be necessarily a hindrance, but the, the, there, there's going to be, particularly with the SEC mentality now, a lot more uh, uh, scrutiny on in terms of dis disclosure, management, and transparency. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. So, and and I I want to thank you. We're just exactly at the moment when this uh, program is supposed to close, and and you both ended, you all ended it so eloquently, talking about. Um, basically the, the idea that both sides need to um, make changes, right? The, the Chinese need to figure out more transparency in terms of management and, and control. And, um, you know, the U.S. needs to, uh, to uh, you know, show some flexibility. So I, I, I want to return to what James said uh, at the very beginning about uh, business being the ballast that kind of has traditionally united United, United States and China, and you know, even during difficult political times. And I sure hope it's so wonderful talking to all of you because you're cool headed and pragmatic and non political, very practical. And uh, so, you know, let's hope that that these kinds of uh, that business can continue. So, I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Um, for the audience out there, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you will uh, become members of China Institute. And um, you know, continue showing up at our programs. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Bye.